the last three, this I guess you, I should say is the third sermon I will be preaching out of one day in Jesus' life. He had spent most of that day uh, preaching to the people, describing the answer to the questions that his disciples had. It was most of the time it said he spoke in parables. In Mark 4, let me give you the, I guess, the last part of last week's sermon, verse 33. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. So he just spoke all day, long day, hard day. Preaching took a lot out of him, and he was tired. In Matthew's account, Matthew uh, chapter 13, he shared seven parables then, but there were other parables that were shared that same day, probably just a day-long time with Jesus, and he got to share the truth of the Word of God. Most of them, though, dealt with God's Word and how we should accept it into our hearts. You see, there was this huge divide that Jesus was trying to explain and show the answer to. We have a holy, pure, wonderful God. And then there's us. We have a sinful nature. We have a sinful desire. And a holy God can't have a relationship with sin. Somebody, something had to bridge the gap. And Jesus volunteered. He was the only one worthy. He was the only one who could do it. And he stepped up and said, I'll be willing, so willing to do it. So Jesus was trying to exp express the divine to us humans. Perfect, imperfect, right? The one who always does things right. We might do something right if we just swing at it and maybe hit something, right? But we're prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. There's a great divide there. So Jesus, through the eyes of perfection, is speaking to the hearts of men filled with sin. But before we go on in Mark chapter 4, let me go to Isaiah 55. And, and Valerie, I didn't give you this ahead of time, so let me just share it with the people there. Y'all just listen. Isaiah 55, in, in verse 3, it says, Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant. God says, a covenant, he will design it, that is God's, put it there for us, a blessing that we can receive. Fully on his part, we're the recipients on our part. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In verse 8, Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Have y'all heard that before? He's got perfect thoughts. We don't always. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So he's having to share his thoughts with us because they're definitely not the same. And in verse 11, and this is one I pray often, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. That is a relationship with us, moving us in that relationship where we can have a relationship with the Holy God. So it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. He promised. He can't lie. He can't come up short. When he speaks the word of God and he describes it to us, it helps us to understand the Almighty. God reveals himself. God calls us to himself. And by faith, we reach beyond the divide and accept the invitation to join God. Ephesians 2 says it succinctly, but it's one of the most important verses in all the Bible. Ephesians 2.8 for by God's grace, for by grace are we saved, that is God's salvation, relationship with Him, through faith. That tells us that faith is important. Hold on. It tells us that faith is of the most importance. 
God in His grace, wanting to bestow that covenant with us, reaching out His hand to us, so that we could have that relationship, salvation. But the way that we get there is by faith. So what we're going to call this is our faith battle. It's our faith battle. Hebrews 11.6 says it is impossible to please God without faith. If you want a smile on your face, you better put a smile on his face. And it says it is impossible to please God unless you have this activated, working thing called faith that is taking the Word of God and acting upon it in your life. It's the substance of things hoped for, the things that we want and we wish and we know that we need in our life, the evidence of things not seen. You're only going to see them if you are by faith reaching out for them. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29, a saying that Jesus spoke to two blind men. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. All right, let's make this very personal. Point to your heart. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. God's not lacking. We're in need. God is reaching out for us. We need to, by faith, reach out and grab Him. And to the degree that you have faith, in that same degree, you will receive it. If you are willing, He's willing. So let's, let's, hold on. The ominous is on us. It's your faith. According to the faith and the belief and the trust that you have in God, in that way, God will open up blessings in your life. According to your faith. Anybody ever seen? Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say the trapeze bar? Shake your head. Let me know that thing in the circus and all around where some idiot, excuse me, some, some very wise person will grab a hold of the trapeze bar and he'll turn loose and jump off that platform up there. And he's trusting that that person on the other side will time the other trapeze bar and fling it down there. And they don't put them where they interlock. It's not like monkey bars. When you're on monkey bars and you're doing this, you don't turn loose a one till you grab the other. Can I get an amen? Right? What happens if you do? That splat. Right? But the trapeze artist, what he has to do, or she, when, when they go down, they, they don't link together, so they've got to turn loose of one before you can grab the other. You've got to, by faith, turn loose of you so that you can grab hold of God. It doesn't get any easier than that, but it doesn't get any harder than that. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. Faith is a muscle. It's like a muscle in our life. And the only way a muscle grows is by exercise. So Jesus had spent all day preaching to these people, and then he decides, you know what? It's time for a little exercise. So he says in uh, Mark 4, uh, verse 35, on the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as it was, and other little boats were also with him, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat and so that it was filling but he was in the stern the aft asleep on a pillow well they woke him and said to him teacher do you not care do you not care that we are perishing then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Let's pause and talk to our Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is perfect and complete and it is for our best interests, interests, in, interest. It is your best for us. So Lord, I pray that we have ears to hear you today. Let your word find its place in our hearts. Father, I doubt that any, there's anybody in this building that has all the faith that they need like the muscle it needs to be exercised and it needs to grow. Because Lord, if we don't exercise it and let it grow, it will atrophy and we will lose what faith we have. So call us to yourself. And Lord, because we do love you, we do want to please you. Let us live lives of faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. They got into a boat. The boats in that day, a big, bigger boat, was about 26 or 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, about four and a half feet tall. How do I know that? Well, in 1986, they found a boat like this in the Sea of Galilee on the northern part of it. They uh, did their testing on it to find the age of the boat, and they found that it was a first century boat. About 26 and a half, 27 foot long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet tall. It would hold about 15 people. Now, remember the sermon before we talked about this, and, and he said that there were two types of boat. There was the big boat that couldn't get all the way up to the shore, and then there was a little paddle boat that they had where they would get out of the boat and come to the shore. This is the big boat. Remember when he was preaching the sermon because there were so many people in the multitude, he moved out and he's sitting in the big boat so that the, the waters could be like a microphone and, and all could hear the gracious, glorious words of God. So he is there and he's preaching to them all day and he, he's taking time in between and he's talking to his disciples. I mean, maybe he had another a parable to give, another sermon to preach a little bit. But at the end of the day, and all are tired, he turns to them and says, let us cross over to the other side. There's some more ministry that needs to happen in the Decapolis. And it says here, now listen, don't miss this point. There were other little boats that went along with him. Now these are not the paddle boats but they're smaller than the big vessels that are 26 and a half foot long. So there would be something in between, maybe one that maybe four people or five people could get in and they begin to follow along. They so desired to be with Jesus night into the day and they didn't know where he was going, but they knew one thing, wherever he goes, that's where I want to be. That's a good thought, isn't it? So they're going out and they're launching out. Now, the Sea of Galilee is just about 700 feet, come on now, below sea level. I think the exact term is 682, but one of the things about it is it depends on the, the water that is there. If they've had a drought, it would be further down. If they had a rainstorm, with the mountains that are around it, that are all around the Sea of Galilee, rain would come. This is a freshwater lake. And the rain would come down, and it would go through the streams, and they would all come into the Sea of Galilee. And it was a very deep sea. Very deep. Okay? So it was a freshwater sea, and it was a, a wonderful time. But Jesus is in the back of the boat, at the aft, the stern, and in the back of the boat, they would have a little bench that was there, and they would store underneath it some of the fishing supplies, but they were not using this boat for fishing, so it was kind of empty there. And sometimes they would get underneath there, or, the, or during it, the person who was directing the boat would, would, would uh, have the paddle in the water, and he would kind of say which way it was supposed to go. But Jesus just crawls up underneath it. Kind of like I did as a kid when I was in church. I'd just crawl up underneath the pew and go to sleep. How many of y'all slept in church? Now, understand I'm watching, so I know the ones that sleep in church. How many of y'all slept in church when you were a child? 
How many of your, 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 your parents brought something and put maybe a blanket or something and laid it in the floor and they could sing all they wanted to and they could preach all they wanted to? It, it, when our kids were young, as long as Lynn had Cheerios, they were happy. I call them dry rocks or church food, you know. Well, Jesus is tired and he's weary and he is just wonderfully resting in the hands of God. The first law of faith is this. If you miss this law, you'll never get the rest of it. The first law of faith is God will take care of you. Now, if you don't believe that, you're going to have trouble. But he's God, and he loves with an amazing love. He loves us to the uttermost. And because he's God and because he loves, do y'all know this, that God will take care of you? If you know that, everything else will fall in place. Oh no, pause, because you are. Right now, how many of you have some kind of a storm? You either just got out of a storm, you're in the midst of a storm, or, or one is brewing on the edges, but storms are part of life. Difficulties are a part of life. Circumstances that you don't necessarily like are part of life. But know this, God will take care of you. And it really doesn't matter what. To what extent or how long or short it may be, God will take care of you. Well, look what happens here in verse 37. A great windstorm arose. Now, the word great there is magos, which is where we get our word mega from. Violent, strong, powerful. And then windstorm. Not thunderstorm. This is not like a great big front came in off the Mediterranean Sea and covers all of Israel and, and this big front comes over and there's just big storms that are there. That's not what this is. That's not what this is. Because the Sea of Galilee is so deep and so far below sea level and the mountains that are around it, the winds could come up. The hot air could come down to the cold air of the cold waters of the Sea of Galilee and they would come rushing over the mountains and, or, or between the mountains, and they would just come pushing down, and a windstorm would come up. They could pop up like that. By the way, still happens today. Still happens today. Someone will be on the Sea of Galilee, and out of nowhere, a windstorm would come up. This is not rain. This is not thunder. This is not lightning. lightning. It's just the winds coming down. And what does wind do with water? Has everybody, anybody ever heard of the word waves? Now, we're not talking about ripples here. It's deep, but it's not a huge lake. And it begins to push it. And, and because of the mountains around, they would be coming in different directions. So you're being hit by all that. Now, how many of you are, are, are understanding that sailors are okay with water outside of the boat? But it's not a friend when it starts to come in the boat. That changes everything, doesn't it? Waves beat into the boat, it says. What does this tell me? Things are now out of control. Out of control. We lose perspective when we are out of control. When the circumstances of life come and we're no longer in control. We don't like it. Um, have y'all ever heard of control freaks? Do y'all know any? Look around. Control freak Baptist church. Can I get an amen? Now, how come it is that the person can look at others and call them a control freak? Oh, but they're not a control freak. It really depends on what level you're in, what degree you're in, and how much out of control, come on, how much out of control you are, that's how much control you want to 
exert. Because when things get out of control, you're going to do everything that you can to get back in control. We're long as we have some concept of control. But faith begins when we find the edge of our control and we see the hand of God extended and we hear Him say, Trust me, God will take care of you. Well, the impossibilities of man are the ways of God. The end of me is the beginning of him. As a matter of fact, you'll never find the beginning of him until you actually find the end of you. Jesus said this, this is the trifecta. In the Gospel of Mark, in three different situations, he said this phrase exactly three times. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Is everyone qualified? If you're a believer, you're qualified. So let's listen to Jesus. This is his advice for you today. If you can believe in him, all things, come on, all things are possible to him who believes. Possible to the extent, to the extent that you have faith, it will be done unto you. All things are possible. It depends on how much we see God, know God, trust God, Give over the control to God. That's what trust means. Roll it over on Him. I know a little bit about that word. I've been studying that word all year long. God brought me into circumstances so that I could learn that word. I had to learn that word. Because I've been out of control too. And you're never going to learn that word until you're out of control. Because it's the safest place to be is you out of control and God in control. And we must learn this. You'll never learn this until you let go. So Jesus is in peace. He's asleep. He's having a good time. He is rest, resting in God's providence. But the disciples were in fear. So what did they do? What do we do when we're out of control and we're afraid? We blame somebody else. It's their fault. We got a new president elect. Has the blame game begun? Oh, they're making an art out of it. I don't know how in the world it happened, but evidently there's about 5,000 people that are at blame for this one winning and that one losing. And they just keep spinning it, but they never point the finger back on themselves. Nobody ever steps up and says, my fault. I did it. I blew it. No, no, no. That's not what we do. That's what we do. That, that's not what the disciples did, did. So they went and woke Jesus up. And here are the first words out of their mouth. Don't you care? Have you ever said that to God? You ever gotten mad? You ever gotten angry? You ever said, why? Have you ever said, I don't understand. How could you let this happen? I thought you loved me. Every one of us have said that at some point in time. And meant it. And meant it. Jesus loved them, but they doubted his love. They doubted his leadership. Come on now. They doubted his outcome. They said, don't you care that we are perishing? They weren't. They just thought they were. They thought they were already finished. Now, church, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I preach this message, but there are two words that came out of verse 39 that absolutely blew me away. Since I'm preaching on a windstorm, it blew me away. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea and said to them, Peace, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. You know what the words are that God gave me this week out of this verse? He arose. He arose. He arose. 
triumphant. By the way, Jesus has never spent one second of all eternity when he wasn't triumphant. He arose. He arose. He arose. When Jesus faced the world that this world had to offer, you know what he did on Resurrection Sunday? He arose. They could beat him. They could whip him. They could mock him. They could not listen to him. They could spit upon him. They could crucify him. They could put him in a grave. Dead. Dead. But on that third day, come on, he arose. That, those two words changed everything for all of mankind. We serve a living Savior. A living, now he's a Savior that reaches out with all the power of God because God is not dead. He is alive and He is working and wants to bless and wants to love in an amazing way. Church, we're the hope for the world because God put His love in us and we share the love, not our love, God's love. He arose when everyone else had given up. He arose when Satan was ready to take a seat on the throne. Because he thought he had won. Jesus arose. When the storms of life arise in your life, you know what you need? You need to get out of the way and Jesus will rise up. When you're at your lowest point, He'll raise you up. When you're ready to give up, the living Lord is just getting started. What did He do? Verse 39 says, he arose and rebuked the wind. Oh, that wind's blowing. That boat's getting tossed. Water's coming in. They're, they didn't have any drama mean. They were getting seasick. Jesus back there sleeping. He wakes up. He stood up and he rebuked the wind, the master of the seas. The word rebuke, rebuke means to admonish, to chide, to reprove, to charge sharp, sharply. What do I say that? The one who was out of control took control. In our life, every one of you, we need to get out of the way so that the Lord of glory can take over. Every one of us are in need of this. To whatever degree you are in, in your life, to whatever degree you are understanding the first rule of faith that God will take care of you. And as you are walking through, we just need to move out of the way. Come on now. Smile real big and say, Jesus, have at it. When I was a young preacher and we had uh, those three small kids, we had three in diapers at the same time. We prayed hard that Jay would get potty trained. Who changed diapers? Whoever was closest. And I remember we were so broke. We had, have y'all ever seen one of those great big baby bottles that was the, it was our, their, their, their bank and it was filled with change. I remember going to the baby bottle, taking the top of it, reaching down and getting changed so I could buy milk and bread. And that was the best place that God had for me. And you know what we did? We let go. We let God. Our kids never missed a meal. They had a house over their head. They had clothes on their back. We taught them the love of Jesus. We lived the love of Jesus before them. And we didn't do it perfectly, but God sure did. God sure did. And he said these words, peace, be still. Literally, he said, hush, be calm. He said to the winds, stop it. Hey, you can hear the wind. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And could you imagine being in, it almost like hurricane force winds, literally. 
So maybe 80, 90 miles an hour pushing down on that lake, blowing the waves around, and he told them, hush. And he said to the waves, be still. And the quiet took over. The winds stopped. The waves The eyes, the jaw, isn't it great when you see the hand of God? Y'all ever know what I'm, y'all know what I'm talking about when you say the glory bumps? How many of y'all like the glory bumps? They just come up and they just jump all over you. And when you get in the presence of God, something awesome happens. I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven, amen? When we see Jesus face to face and our faith comes true in sight. And, and, and I, like the song says, I don't know if I'll be jumping up and shouting. I don't know if I'll be on my, my, my face before him. I don't know if I'll be singing. I will not be crying. I know one thing for certain. I love him because he first loved me. I'm there by his grace. What a wonderful thing it is to know the Almighty and how he fills my soul. Oh, how sweet Jesus is. Peace, be still, and there's a great calm. To the extent of your pain, we revel and we shine in the goodness of the glory of God. So he turns to his disciples, ask a question. Why are you so fearful? If I want to be like Christ, let me ask you this question. I don't know all your circumstances, but why are you fearful? What's the first rule of faith? God will take care of you. You believe that? Y'all believe that? So why are you fearful? Why? Well, you ever heard faith over fear? Your faith will make fear go away. It's either fear over faith or faith over fear. Jesus said to them, how is it possible that you have no faith? People, I won't say people, we accept fear as natural, but faith as foreign. We're comfortable with fear. We've been there enough. But faith, we see that as foreign in our life. We would rather live in the fear that we know than the faith that we have yet to discover. Y'all remember COVID? I was in a meeting during COVID, and a, a person said it, and they said it loud, and they said it very demonstratively. Uh, they said it so to make a point. They said, they said, if someone says to me, faith over fear one more time, I'm going to scream. Some of y'all were in that meeting. They had totally dismissed the first rule of faith. In our world, they said, oh, but we've got to do this. We've got to do this. I'm, I'm here to tell you, things are going to happen where you can be the most cautious person in the world. And we battled through that. And you know what I said to everybody? You just do what you feel led to do. You want to mask up? Mask up. I don't care. You want to come without a mask? I don't care. Don't breathe on those that are that don't, are wearing them, right? If people want to walk around in so much fear, and it, it's like they want to go bury themselves in a cave, that's up to them. They would rather live with fear than launch out in faith. And to a degree of what you're in, all of us are like that. We can look back on it with, with 2020 hindsight. I'm not saying COVID was easy. People I know died of it. People in this building today almost died of it. I understand that. But it really doesn't matter. 
We could die any day. I was going to the ball game last night. We got the commerce there at Banks Crossing. There were two wrecks within one mile, and they looked bad. I'm sure, most likely, it was people out on a Saturday night to either go get their groceries or get something to eat or go down with 92,000 idiots down at the University of Georgia and watch a ball game. I got home at 1 o'clock this morning. I haven't fallen asleep yet in the middle of my sermon yet. It doesn't matter how much control you think you want to exert over something. The greatest thing we can do as Christians is let him be in control. I'm going to say something else and I'm going to close. And I've never seen this in the scripture too before. God's word is inexhaustible. I, I had heard about it, but I never thought about it too much. When Jesus got into the boat, with his disciples and said, let us go to the other side. Other boats went with them. Other smaller boats went with them. Now, if the disciples are in a 27-foot boat, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet thick, or up and down, if they're scared to death, if water's going into them, I wonder how those three or four or five other people in those smaller boats felt. Now, they're not in the boat. They don't know the conversation that's going on, but I think they were scared to death too. Would you agree? But they were the beneficiaries of what Jesus was doing in that boat. What they were experiencing in that boat. Wonder how they felt when all of a sudden the wind stopped and the waves stopped. Now, that don't just happen. And in the same voice that Jesus spoke on the shore where the multitudes could hear, what about those people in the smaller boat? Do you think they may have heard? You think they were scared? Maybe they heard Jesus say, where is your faith? Maybe they heard Jesus say, how is it possible that you have no faith? There may be some people listening to me today that you understand that trapeze bar and you've launched out, but you have been too afraid to turn loose and grab hold of Jesus. You're never going to know him until you do. Now, I promise you, when you're in the hands of the Almighty God, it's a peaceful place to be. When we get to heaven, the glory of God will shine. And for the first time in my heart, I will be fully at rest. But there's also others watching. And you don't know about faith. You haven't experienced faith. And maybe you need to lean on somebody else's faith. Now you're going to think about it. You're going to make, you, every one of us have someone in our life that we've seen as a godly example of what it is to walk with God. We admire them. We, we are so blessed to have those people in our life. They may have gone through some very difficult times. They may have gone through some, some poor times. They may have gone through some brokenness. They may have gone through all kinds of circumstances that would crush anyone, but you have seen the faith that they had as it was placed in the hands of God, and you have seen God do mighty works. Maybe we need to look. Maybe we need to learn and listen. Maybe we need to latch hold of their faith as you grow your faith. If God can do it for them, then He can do it for me. The love that I've seen God pour out on them in the worst of circumstances, that's what I need in my life. That's what I want in my life. You see, there may be some things that God's trying to teach you to let go of. Just let it go and grab a hold of. Peace. Be still 
Hush. Maybe we need to tell all that chatter that comes against us, that beats against us and tells us it can't be done. Maybe we need to tell all those doubts and anxieties. Hush. Be still. Be calm. Because the first rule of faith is what? Say it again. Oh, come on, church. Learn it. Live it. Love it. 